Coming up for you, we are interviewing one of my favorite researchers in the world, and that is the one and only Richard Grove. In this show, we get into the real power structure and shadow government, which is institutions like the CFR, the RIA, the BIS, and Richard goes super deep into the history of how these groups were formed. And keep your pens and pencils handy because Richard drops tons of references and books you want to check out, and he also gives an overview of the book Tragedy and Hope. And all honestly, I could talk with Richard all day, and I'm sure you guys could listen to him all day as well, as he is one of the few researchers out there that drops truth bombs or truth bombs that even I'm not aware of. So hope you guys enjoy this. And if you are watching this on YouTube, then you are getting this late. To get on our email list and receive this first, type in bit.ly slash Tim John email, all lowercase, or you can go to timandjohnshow.com. And if you want to be one of the first to get interviews like Richard Grove and get interviews like Jim Cantrell, co-founder of SpaceX, then you will have to be on our email signup list. And even better yet, you can be on our emergency text backup list. Where you also will get a free copy of my ebook, How It's Rigged, The Economy. That number will be scrolling down below once the show starts, but that is the number is 71. 441 and you want to text in the body of the email message or text message liberty advisor one word no spaces anyways hope you guys enjoy the show welcome everyone to another tim and john show and today we are rounding out our week of killer interviews with none other than richard grove we are streaming this live out to float and we'll be sending this to our email and text subscribers first and then this will be on youtube but we are live um, and uh we had just an absolute murder's row uh, this week of interviews. We were on Union of the Wanted along with Richard, where we got to interview uh, none other than Roger Stone. And then yesterday we had uh, real estate guys uh, on uh, Russell Gray, and, and he absolutely blew me away. And then we had a little guy named Jim Cantrell, who's one of the co-founders of a company you may have heard of called SpaceX. And that was probably maybe aside from Gio Griffin, probably one of the coolest interviews we've ever been a part of. Yeah. So, you know, Richard definitely has, uh, you know, big shoes to fill right now. We know he's up to the task. But when it comes to alternative media, uh, you know, my real, you know, sort of Mount Rushmore would be guys like James Corbett, Dan Dix, Gio Griffin, Ernest Hancock. And I would put Richard Grove also on that list as well. So if you guys don't know him, you definitely have to check out his work, which can mainly be found at tragedyandhope.com. Also, now the new website would be grandtheftworld.com. So Richard can, can tell us. All about that, and you guys might know him also as uh, host of the Peace Revolution podcast, and soon to be the like we just mentioned the Grand Theft World podcast. And we definitely want to get into tragedy and hope. Definitely want to get into what you've got, you know, coming up with Grand Theft World. But first, wanted to, if you wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how you got into all this. You know, your story as a whistleblower. And uh, thank you. Welcome to the show, Richard. Tim and John, thank you for hosting a liberty-based platform where I could speak freely with Parhesia. How are you guys doing today? Fantastic. We're doing great. It's uh, I know I know Ernie always Ernest Hancock always has you on for his birthday. So, you know, it's just, you know, I've, I've always wanted to interview you and it's just, you know, a pleasure <laughs> to have you on the show. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be on here and I enjoyed thoroughly doing the uh, Union of the Unwanted on Ricky Verandas's uh, platform over there. He does find interviews in long form on his Ripple Effect podcast, but I thought the uh, the public house meeting style of uh union of the unwanted which we've also uh brought into grand theft world where you have a panel of people who are interested and they're literate and they ask questions and they look things up and we share that amongst each other and uh to be able to have those dynamics today i think is essential and i think there's a reason why it wasn't here before it's even more necessary for yeah. us to get out of our echo chambers to to learn about how is the other side on any perspective thinking so we can outgrow our current limitations and these platforms and podcasts uh, in the video form being brought also into the audio world for people doing chores and doing things out there in life been immensely useful and i think it's uh it's a good pivot for liberty and uh and freedom to le leverage these tools at this critical time in history, because I've been around a while and I've seen things pick up immensely with momentum and uh, a lot of assumptions, like the assumptions and momentum pick up like in a one to one ratio. So now is a very interesting time to be alive in history, for sure. Yeah. And so I know that, uh, you know, I've, I've heard a story before about how you were a whistleblower. I want to see if you can get into a little bit of that, of, of maybe that's and, if, and what part that played into you kind of waking up to, uh, you know, the kind of overall power structure. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more whistleblowers today to go from as an example, like there's uh, Zach from Google. He's a famous whistleblower today. Today he's getting a lot of interviews back when I blew the whistle. There was basically nobody 
nobody in the public that knew about whistleblowers. There was no famous whistle, not since the Pentagon Papers, 40 years before, right? So I went to, uh, I went to university for five years. That degree that I got out of school did not help me get a job in the corporate world. But what did help me get a job are the skills I developed during college. So I took those skills, uh, high value sales skills. I went into the corporate world and I made a very lucrative living from the time I graduated. I had a job before I graduated. I didn't even go to graduation. So I do have the certificate, but I didn't throw the hat because I was two weeks into a job. I'd already gotten a first paycheck by the time the other people were waiting around their piece of paper to go wait in line to get a job. So I had a really good experience for several years and I was thriving in that environment and I was doing very well. Uh, I earned a million dollars before I was 30 with that skill set. So I wasn't somebody who was struggling or unsuccessful. I was an early leader that was being groomed for executive roles and took on uh, some of the largest corporate accounts in the world. I handled the world's largest banks on Wall Street. I handled defense contractors and I had uh, clients also in Silicon Valley for a part of my career. So. I'm well versed in the technocracy now, but I didn't know anything about this back then. When I came to be a whistleblower in 2003, it was under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So to give a little side history, because nobody knows what that is still. Uh, in 2002, we had some of the world's largest accounting frauds in history. There was like Enron, Tyco International, Anderson Consulting. World and time. so- Worldcom, especially, yeah. And Enron crashed a couple days before 9 11. Everyone forgets this. And it was under investigation, and all the records were in World Trade Center 7. So, one of the biggest frauds ever just goes poof, along with a whole bunch of other useful records in that filing cabinet that they called World Trade Center 7. That's another story. My whistleblowing specifically was that my company that I worked for, I was selling a product that was supposed to be able to uh, sell into the Fortune 500 market because they're mandated by Congress under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act to preserve certain records, to preserve audit trails for email and strategic communications between companies so that they couldn't be laundering billions and billions of dollars and ripping people off. So as an American, as an upright, honest citizen brought up in a small Midwest my whistleblowing town, specifically, I went there and I'm like, I'm helping the world, I'm helping our economy by getting this software in there that keeps these people from cheating. So I felt really good about that. I was a couple of weeks into that job and one of my accounts was Tyco International, who at that time was in the middle of an FBI and SEC investigation. So I marched into that conference room, a meeting with their chief, uh, chief legal officer, chief compliance officer, their, the head lawyer, the chief general counsel, Valley Baudisano. And she's there and she's got a whole team and I got a couple of people on my side and I'm the new sales guy at the, at the company. I got the solution. So as I start into my pitch and saying, look, by putting a Legato email extender into your business, you guys are going to be able to preserve all these records the way the, the FBI and the SEC want them preserved and, and all these limitations that you guys have, we can help you meet these requirements. And she, and this is in the court transcript. So exactly what I'm saying is what I said in court. She leans in and says, I'm not interested in keeping this data and preserving it. I'm interested in getting rid of it. So it looks like it was never there. So my jaw is like on the, I don't know what to say to that. One of the technical people that I'm working with that's well seasoned and whatever they're doing here at this new company I'm working at, he says, Oh, we can talk to your technical people. We can, you know, then they have a sidebar meeting. Like I'm not in that conversation. I thought, okay, that's weird, but I'm a naive kid from the Midwest. What do I know? A couple of weeks later, another one of my clients, which is the National Association of Securities Dealers, this is NASD there in Maryland. This is not like some New York company run by his. Baudasano also said, when I ran such and such merger, we cooked the books. That's how we did the merger, right? So she said this all in a meeting. I repeated it in court. The other side did not have any evidence to contest it. They were there as well. So it's on the record. That's and the NASD that's fact. is now basically FINRA, just for those yes. of you who are newer. Yeah. So the what was FINRA back then? I'm in a meeting in, in there. It was a, a guy named John Brady. And I'm pitching Legato's email extender that's supposed to protect the system of not only them, but like the whole market that they're watchdogging over. And one of their guys says, uh, actually, John Brady's the guy who called it out. The other guy was named Mark Rippey. So the two guys on their side, Rippey's like the manager. Uh, John Brady was the uh, technical guy. And Brady says, hey, when the jar file is being moved to the worm storage, there's a place where it can be deleted and it looks like the file never existed. The worm drive is a read once, uh, write once, read many drive. 
the jar file is a, is a piece of information that's being moved and it's supposed to be a content container that can't be breached. And it has tracking through the whole system for audit purposes. So what they're telling me across the table is your product has a back door in it for the specific purpose that the product's being installed. So it's like buying a prophylactic that has a hole in it. It's not gonna do the job you think it's there to do. It's actually keeping you from being protected. So in so far as that, I had management in the meeting and they were like, oh, then don't worry about this. And you know, it's they, for them, it's just not their customer. I'm concerned because you guys have me fronting for you going around to these various companies like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and all these other big financial companies and getting this into their system. So somebody from the outside can come in without their knowledge and do shenanigans or someone inside can do shenanigans. Like it was antithetical to what I was about. And as I continue to voice concern and eventually resistance, I was met with resistance. I was met with intimidation, coercion, aggression that started to scale up. So it was ironic that I had been training clients on Sarbanes-Oxley, like here's the product and here's also how to blow the whistle under this congressional mandate if you guys saw something wrong. So I had run training classes, teaching people how to be whistleblowers on the product I was selling because that was part of my gig at that company. So ironically on my 30th birthday, I called the SEC and I talked to a lawyer and the lawyer I talked to was already investigating my company from a year before and they had an open case with one of our other divisions. So I basically articulated everything I just told you and he said, do you know we could put you in prison for telling us this, that you're not allowed to tell people outside the company, this sort of thing. So I got an intimidation rap from the lawyer in San Francisco named Kevin, I forget who was running the case, but he was running the Logicon Legato case. Logicon was a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman. There was a whole bunch of funny business going on. So when I call the guy to say, hey, can you give me some guidance? I got intimidation and threats from that. So a couple of days later, I formally blew the whistle by sending a, an email to the general counsel of the company I worked for, putting him on notice just as I had trained Sarbanes-Oxley clients to do. And when I went to court, what I found out was the day I sent the email, that general counsel, the company ordered my termination, did not provide protection as the law mandates. He ordered my termination. So in the law, the person who does that is supposed to go to prison for a couple of years, not collect $2 million a year in salary. But as I found out in real life through going to court and being pro se and representing myself and having my evidence stand the day, meaning it couldn't be contested by the multi-billion dollar law firm on the other side, Skadden, Arps, Marr, and Flom, right? The history of those guys, real short tangent. JP Morgan needed someone to do hostile takeovers. The white glove law firm of Wardell, uh, I was like Polk and Wardell wouldn't do the JP Morgan dirty business. JP Morgan groomed, this is not the person, this is the company, JP Morgan groomed uh, Joe Flom, and then they created Skadden, Arps, Marr, and Flom, and they defended the United States government in BCCI, in Iran Contra, and a whole bunch of other things that are nefarious, like deep cover, national security black marketeering, arms dealing, drugs dealing, right? When, when the government got in trouble, they called that law firm. I went up against them in court by myself and I held my ground. Now I lost the case nine months later, but it did take them nine months to come up with an excuse of why can't we accept this guy's evidence and give him a decision, right? So I learned that process. And during that process, I read the book on JP Morgan. I was reading that book when I was in court. So I come home from a day of like testimony or defense. It was either Monday or Tuesday. And it's the house of Morgan by Ron Chernow, which I usually it's over here someplace. I'll find it. But in there, he tells us, they tell the story. JP Morgan needed this law firm. It's on the bottom of a right-hand page. It's like the paragraph. And I remember sitting there thinking, Holy shit. Like this is 80 years later from when they did this. And I'm up against those guys in court right now. The company that I sued, my employer, the founder of it was a billionaire who was at that time the ambassador to Ireland under George W. Bush. He was also Dick Cheney's largest fundraiser. So even though my evidence was valid, my evidence was accepted in court, my evidence stood up to cross-examination because of those political ties, 
because of those other things going on that were not on my map through education. I wasn't taught about how the world really works and how it works is those people with deep pockets doing arms dealing and drug money laundering, they're pretty much untouchable. Even if you have their executives on tape, legally recorded, admitted into the court and heard by the judge, even if that's all there, you're not going forward. And that's a tough lesson that it, that it took me a couple of years to learn. But what a wonderful lesson. Like if I had just turned my head and coughed and like gone along with it and taken the money, like all those other schmucks that are still there doing that stuff, I would have denied myself the knowledge of all the interesting stuff I talk about, all the interesting things I teach about, because it was only after taking that uncharted, you know, right turn and pivot. And it's like, I'm going to stand my ground because I knew my worth. I didn't want to prostitute myself to something that that had no integrity because I already knew I had skills and I could put them anywhere else in other other situations. But by remaining in that situation and continuing to endure increasing resistance, like they had somebody else call into one of my accounts and book a deal that got paid to a private Amex card and all this shenanigans that they were going to hang me out to dry with. Right. This was September 2003, two months before I blew the whistle. So it's things like this that made me blow the whistle. I had the client call me. He's like, hey, I got a call from Richard Bruno and Charlie Giametta, and they're telling me to do this and that you authorize. I was like, no, I didn't authorize any of this. And I took all that evidence, including the client's voicemail, where he says that, I took it to court. I played it in court. It was admitted as evidence. The other side had no defense against it other than the guys with the big rings shake hands in the hallway, Right. My side, the company had executives. There were a lot of ex NFL football players that were not qualified to work at a high tech company like that to be paid as sales executives or anything else. And when they're shaking hands with the judge in the hallway and the judge is fawning over their Super Bowl rings and shit like that, that's when my wife, she's like, it's in the bag. Okay. That was like day three. So good learning experience. Uh, I don't have a victim mentality whatsoever. It was, it was thrilling to read the rules of court. It was thrilling to be my own attorney. It was thrilling to put a multi-billion dollar company up against the wall because they offered to settle right before we started the trial. And I said, if you're willing to try to settle, you know, I have the evidence. I'm here. I already prepped. I want to play. I want to do this thing. I'm presenting it. I'm getting it on the record. And we did. But, you know, in hindsight, <clears throat> I probably uh, could have, should have learned to do better things with my talents before then. But that was the turning point. And that led to a 20,000 hour investment of unprogramming myself from schooling and filling myself with the knowledge of that which exists in this world to make an accurate map and to be able to have a compass where I could tell fact from fiction in the objective world so I could get from A to B consistently and conduct myself in a professional manner going forward without having to suck at the tit of some big corporation to get my paycheck and wear my golden handcuffs. Man, that was a fascinating story, and you know, I'm sorry I had to you know go through all that, and you know, but I guess you know, there's always you know silver linings to everything. So it sounds like you don't listen, you know, you're not looking for the you know the news guard, you know, approved checklist before you decide and whether or not something's uh, you know valuable. And and unfortunately, in today's society, we really gotten to the point where everybody is you know we're at this point where the media is saying, oh, we're uh, we're CNN and we're going to tell you what's true, and people. It's almost like they need to be coddled now, like, oh, we can't have this information that could be dangerous. And that's why, you know, a lot of our friends have been deplatformed and, you know, even, you know, yeah. Josh Seekerson and myself and, and John over at Wham, we've been deleted. Uh, you know, it wasn't really, you know, a huge surprise, but they don't want this type of information getting out. And we really do appreciate that we've got someone like you to, you know, help get a lot of this information out. And, uh, you know, I wish I discovered you sooner than that could have just could have been like a big uh, shortcut well, to a lot of this stuff. But <laughs> yeah. I you know, I got, you know, woken up and read Creature from Jekyll Island, which, you know, mentions the book Tragedy and Hope, uh, you know, frequently in there. And I'm embarrassed to say I've not read Tragedy and Hope. I do know a lot of the story behind it. But for the, but if the words Tragedy and Hope doesn't trigger something in someone's mm -hmm. synapses and, and, you know, when I see the, the word, I know exactly what it means. And when I see Joe Biden, uh, you know, talking about getting that son of a bitch uh, in Ukraine fired. At, at the, with a council on foreign relations backdrop behind them, yeah. and then when I see you guys like John Brennan admit that geo, geo Virick, oh, Paul, remember Paul Walker was there talking about gold, but they actually cut that out of the council of foreign relations presentation. There was a little bit at the end of him praising how great gold is. 
Yeah, there's and there's John Brennan literally talking uh, about chemtrails with the CFR behind him, the acting <laughs> CIA director at the time. Yeah. And it's like obviously if they're admitting that, but you you, know, you try to saying this stuff, people think you're crazy, and here they are just flaunting it. And then uh, you've got guys like you know, or people like Hillary Clinton, you know, saying that oh, to Richard Haas, who is the, who's the president. Oh, hey, you know, we're glad that you're just down the street now because now we don't have to go as far to get our orders. Can you kind of give the history of, you know, what? tragedy and hope is what you know who cecil rhodes is it's funny because my dog we adopted him and found out he's a rhodesian ridgeback so i'm like oh great now i've got you know a <laughs> reminder to cecil rhodes but you know when it, when you hear can you let some people know like like who cecil rhodes is who the you know then how that led into the you know the royal institute of affairs and Council of foreign relations because it's such a critical component and for anyone that's really woken up you know because of covid or they've woken up in the past two years I think a lot of people, well-meaning people, have been sort of psyoped into QAnon or psyoped into they've taken their their energies and 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 have found out something's wrong, but then they've sort of misplaced it in the exact wrong place. And someone like you and and even us to a lesser extent, it's just maddening to see you know what we've known for years, especially guys like Ernest Hancock have known for years, and then seeing all the voting fraud that's going on and and, and then you know I wa I did you know subject myself to watching Rudy Giuliani's press conference uh, yesterday and it really was amazing uh what's what the media is not covering of what he and then it's but it's just you know have people now talk about oh there's these voting machines and they're using they didn't use the term fraction magic but and then they're flipping votes and there's algorithms it's like yeah no shit we've been well, talking about this stuff for like five years yeah and some people talking about it longer than this and uh but yeah sorry for the you know that rant but you know could you kind of just get into the history um, of you know what tragedy just, and hope is and, and then i know john wants to ask you first let john jump in yeah just one thing you know it's uh, i i look at a lot of media in scandinavia i'm norwegian by descent so uh, you know there's you could clearly see who they're actually like taking uh, their uh, their uh, news from, you know, which is you know AP or CNN. It, it, it's just like uh, daunting. And then I, you know, have I did a rant, you know, I said that government is non-essential uh, just yesterday. And then I had a Norwegian uh, old uh, military buddy of mine. He just comes out and it's like, oh, Unabomber 2.0. <laughs> but uh, that John just shows you perfect, yeah. Yeah, John brings up just... a good point about you know yeah. Roy, you know things like you know AP and Reuters, and I know that with the yeah. union they wanted, you got a, a little bit into you know Reuters and their history. So maybe first can we get into yeah. the Reuters history because it is, and, and you know you go on Twitter. I mean, I'm I'm off of Twitter now. I deleted my account, about to l delete my Facebook, but it sees oh well the elections. Not that you know we all know that elections are all BS anyways, but it says you know the all the elections are certified by you know AP doesn't say this and Reuters doesn't say this, and so you know can you get, maybe can first give a little history of, into Reuters and where they came from and then maybe trans pivot into uh you know cecil Rhodes and the cfr and i'll tell you what when i get to 1828 remind me of reuters and what okay. i'm going to do is i'm going to answer all those questions in a narrative format in chronological order and then at the end i'll take you to my history blueprint i'll click a button like this you can see it and then um i'll take you through so you could actually follow along because i can give you a link at the end of the show and you could just click through the stuff that i'm about to show you so it's a narrative, but it's backed up. The narrative is only is only consists of artifacts of evidence that exist in in exact in objective reality. Does that make sense? Let me take a sip. It does, and just so people know, we had maybe like a three minute pre show call for this. It's not like we you know we're CNN and have been scripting. This no, we're doing it months. live. This is <laughs> yeah. we're going live, and this is just you know three guys, mainly Richard, with information that's off the top of his head, which is why you know we love to have you know brilliant minds like yourself on the show. And I consider it good exercise. So, so the way I could start this is in 1776, America separated from the British Empire. And at that point, the British Empire had a lot of interests, not just in America, around the world. It was in the colonialism. It, it formed colonies through trade. So it would start with the East India Company and they would set up a trading post. And then from there, they'd set up a Freemasonic Lodge. And then from there, you would have little colonies. And from there, they took over countries. There's a great book called all the countries we've invaded and a few we didn't get around to. And basically, if you look at the map, at one point or another, the British Empire pretty much had taken over the whole world at one time or another, not all at once. But that goal was there to take over the world. So after 1814 at the Battle of New Orleans, when the British get beaten off for a second time, sorry, that's a bad pun. And then uh, they kind of leave us alone. Why did they leave us alone? Well, they started to go subjugate China and India more specifically. So while the American colonies are left up until the Civil War without a whole lot of British interaction. And, and Canada, some, sorry to interrupt and you. And Canada, and yeah. Canada. 
Um, so they're part of this triangle trade of molasses and cotton. And, uh, you know, over here on the Atlantic, on the other side, the British had another triangle trade where they take finished cotton from Manchester mills and they take it over to India and they trade it for opium. They take that opium to China because China wouldn't trade for Western goods. And they had a problem before the American revolution, the British empire had a problem and Europe had a problem insofar as they opened up trade with China. They started to get the tea and the silks and these sort of things, but the Chinese wouldn't take any of the Western goods because they were inferior and lacked excellence. So all the silver and gold from Europe was going over to China. At some point, the people over in Europe and Britain and the East India Company, they said, hey, we got to get some of that back. These people won't trade with us. How shall we deal with this? And starting after Queen Elizabeth, because she was part of the opium empire that was built forward, they started to bring opium into China and then forcibly. And then there was two opium wars during the 1800s while America was left alone pretty much from Britain, there were opium wars going on on the other side of the world. This goes on in the 1850s, right before our American Civil War. So at that time, so I'll go back to 1828. I'm going to have to go back probably to 1805 a little bit to tell this story, because it's not just the British Empire. There was a merger between the empire power, the monarchy, and an international banking power. And that merger, the story of that merger starts in 1805, 1806, and it turns into Napoleon invading uh, Prussia, what is now Germany, these areas of uh, the Germanic tribes. Napoleon's in there. He has an amateur ragtag army of revolutionaries with him, and the Prussians pride themselves on professional armies. When the Prussians get beaten by Napoleon at Jena, it has a whole bunch of consequences down the line. From that line of causality, you have the Prussian education system, which is a system of indoctrination. So people will stand on the battlefield in, in front of the bullets. That's what it was created for after von Clausewitz and these other guys made observations. Why did they lose to Napoleon, right? That's brought into America to dumb us down in the 20th century. But the part we need to follow is the British in this endeavor have Wellington, who doesn't have enough money for his troops around 1811, 1812. So the Rothschilds, Nathan Rothschild specifically, borrows or gives. Was it his to give? We don't know. But this is where the gold comes from. The East India Company, gold that Nathan gives and uh, puts the government of Britain into debt to him to win the war. And then he greatly prospers on the news that Wellington wins the last battle at Waterloo. So that's where Napoleon's defeated. That's the end of that little story. But from there, the Rothschilds then in 1818 bailed out the Bank of England. So, so they didn't just bail out the country and the monarchy and Wellington with the East India Company gold that came from subjugating Chinese people with opium. They also bailed out the Bank of England. So after you bail out the Bank of England and the monarchy, I'd have to say you're at least on equal footing and they need each other. The financial power is not a whole lot of good without the monarchical power and the monarchical power. If they don't have money in their in their war trunks, they can't do all these things around the world. So it's a it's a symbiotic relationship that goes up to 1828 when the Rothschilds partnered with uh, the Reuters news company and became involved in being a hub of transmitting news. Now, this is well after the Wellington and they got the news first. So they already had an interest in how do we get information faster than other people? Because that gives us an advantage. These are all strategic, tactical aspects of uh, business, and they are to be observed and not judged. Right. I'm just looking at the history. I'm not making any judgments. Um, so they get involved with Reuters. Then uh, also The Economist is a, a Rothschild entity up to this day. They both still have influence. Uh, together, Reuters and economists with the Rothschild banking family. And the what we see today, this whole Davos uh, World Economic Forum Great Reset, this is not new. This is something they called in 2013 inclusive capitalism. So if you type in inclusive capitalism, you'll see their website's still up. It's E.L. Rothschild, Lynn Forrester to Rothschild, Christine Lagarde from the World Bank, Prince Charles is there. And they say in this room at Lagarde's keynote speech. She says, I want to thank Lynn Rothschild. I want to thank E.L. Rothschild. I want to thank Prince Charles. In this room, we have one third of the world's wealth. 
And we think that there's, there's too much poverty and we should use our wealth to take care of that, right? So basically the people causing the massive problems out there in the world have now assigned themselves to be the solution carriers. And that is fully what Klaus Schwab is like, uh, is latching onto with Great Reset. So it's not just, and you just saw Prince Charles a couple of days ago, shilling for the whole Great Reset. They are conglomerating their policies and plans and putting them about 10 years ahead of schedule right now. Because what they want to do in 2030, everyone on the planet being vaccinated, that was a United Nations agenda as of May 1st this year. They made that agenda known. Uh, they're pushing that up to right now. And Bill Gates had the, uh, the dec decade of the vaccine, which was the past 10 years that he was partnered with Fauci on. Right. So there's this there's a whole bunch of history in flux right now. But you need to understand uh, where those originate to see where it's going to go. Right. So you need to know the history of Fauci, for instance, uh, stick into that timeline. We get up to the point right before the American Civil War. The British have not been able to really get a strong stranglehold on this country, except through central banking and their partnerships with the financiers. So there is a lot of Rothschild banking money in the administration of Andrew Jackson. I hate to tell everybody. The Rothschilds had Andrew Jackson's portrait in their offices. This is in her private papers. You learn this. Stuff. Yeah, and, so, and and Edmund Rothschild met with uh, J.P. Morgan to settle over in in the United States and start taking over. Yeah, so I, did, I didn't know any of that about the uh, Andrew Jackson photos. That's fascinating. And I'm pretty sure when I interviewed Bill Still, I talked to him about that aspect because I was like, "Hey, you made these movies, and we're talking about this, but I also know this other stuff, and you know about that." Um, but sticking on the the topic there, so. During the Civil War, we know Lincoln had to print his greenbacks. Not everyone understands why he had to print his own money. Why would? Because the side that had the money was back in the Confederacy. It's that simple. And they want to say, like the Rothschilds would deny that. They said, we did not fund the Confederacy. In fact, Meyer Rothschild, uh, when he was asked about that, he said, we did not fund the Confederacy with this emergency loan. It was, it was the Christian house down the street that did that Christian banking house, meaning it wasn't his banking house. It was this Christian banking house that participated in that. And I said, Oh, that's an interesting claim. Let's do some reading. Who is that other banking house? Oh, they're converted to Christians. Right. And they are fronts for Rothschilds in a whole bunch of uh, proto Palestinian cultivation efforts of colonizing Palestine in the 1800s. So when you look into like that, that claim, Oh, that seems cool until you check into these guys know each other and they definitely have a working business relationship where they are used as proxies. And it can be seen here, here and here. So I'm not assuming they were the proxy. Like, you know, I'm just saying that's there to be studied and looked at. Right. So um, the most prolific piece of evidence that everyone can get their hands on is a book printed in 1961. And uh, it's, published by Stanford University, and it's published on the centennial of when these private letters were written. So they are written in 1861 up through March, right when the Civil War was about to kick off. And the papers are from Solomon de Rothschild back home across the ocean to his cousins and his brothers and his family. He is visiting all the, uh, the, the most wealthy and powerful families in the North, as well as the South. He's staying with them for extended periods of time. He gets to know intimately their goals, their aspirations, why they are disagreeing. And he goes through his letters describing it in a variety of capacities. But what he's saying is, um, as there was a bunch of people in the middle who were not looking for war, they were not looking for revolution, they were just like in the middle. And as things got more extreme on the slavery side and the abolitionist side, and as these guys started taking militant, um, violent action these guys started taking militant violent action and that like centrifugal force he doesn't use centrifugal force but the way he described it made me think it's like the the people from the middle get spun out to the extremes okay that is exactly what social media as per the social dilemma has shown us in evidentiary form with testimony that is exactly what social media is doing to not only this country but it's been used to divide and conquer around the world and the people we're playing against they've already overthrown dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of countries during our lifetime with other tools before they even had social media. 
right? You have uh, Gene Sharp's plan for revolution that has been used for uh, CIA overthrow of multiple countries. Now Soros picked up that tactic set and said, what happens if we do that on America? And Soros said, according to a number of sources, but CNN money source is the one I tweeted yesterday. And it says Soros dedicates 18 billion to his democratic activism. What does that mean? Democratic. That's not constitutional republic. He's putting in seeds of discontent, like discontent. He's putting in wedges. He's buying off DAs and everybody else that'll take money because he had 18 billion to put into the campaign to kind of destroy America. And that's not just his goal. Right. He also tried to destroy Great Britain at one point with his trading. He spent he's two a, and a half a million globalist. dollars on our local county sheriff in, in Maricopa County. Two and a half million dollars in a sheriff race. Yeah. And he, he's his organization. When you search their donations, there's a whole bunch of stuff that ties back into the last WikiLeaks from the 2016 election. But we can't go into that here. We're, st we're still on track. We're only 1860s. So one of the Solomon de Rothschild quotes in that book, which you can pick up for five dollars used still today on the market. It's like this. The north and south are like two locomotives under full heads of steam headed toward each other on the same track. Only destruction will ensue. There will be no vanquish. There will be no winner. But all of the, the resources on both sides will be consumed. And that will make both sides go into debt for the third party that sits back and watches it all happen. Now, I'm paraphrasing there. I highly recommend. Go ahead and read the book for yourself. I also did a Smart Reads YouTube video. And what um, is that book called for, for the listeners? Uh, it's the, the subtitle is the private papers of Solomon de Rothschild, but it's like letters from home or letters. Uh, it has a weird name, but it's the memoirs of Solomon de Rothschild by Sigmund diamond, who is also a very accomplished author. I have another book of his over here called compromise campus on how intelligence agencies took over universities and brought, uh, psychological warfare, socialism, and communism into the university infrastructure. So Sigmund Diamond was a fine writer during his day, and he wrote two books that are very valid and uh, necessary understandings to, to be able to comprehend what's going on out there. Compromise Campus, and then the other one was the, the memoir, the private letters, private home letters of Solomon de Rothschild. Yeah, no, it's all, it's all fascinating. It's definitely Do you want me to look it up? Out. I have it here in my brain model. Yeah, yeah, might, might as well. Yeah. So, John, no, it's, you, uh, yeah, I'll just do it here. Yeah. No, it, it's interesting, the banking, uh, you know, how, how much they have control. And, and of course, I've been reading, like, I have several books from the from the uh, Rothschild Museum that I managed to get. Uh, this one here, actually, is uh, is not very easy to come by. It was there pulled it out Casu of a... Uh, yeah, Casual cool. View of America, Solomon de Rothschild Letters, 1859 to 1861 yeah. by Sigmund Diamond. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting, and and this is a book too that I I really love. Like you, might, I don't know if you read this one. It's Edmund de Rothschild's memoirs. You know, a gilt edge life. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah, and, and I, actually, I I haven't gotten through the whole book, but it's it's very interesting. It's uh, like now he was a junior partner with his dad uh, and his uncle uh, over in England. So it talks about how he travels all across, you know, the the United States uh, and uh, also into Canada a lot. You know how they uh, basically uh, they started the Rio Tinto, one of the biggest gold producers yeah. in the world. That's they right. own uh, and they still own major share capital in that uh, in that group. So and yeah, their ownership of, is yeah. well obscured at this point because they have yeah. corporations within corporations and they have yeah, Rothschild yeah. Inc. and Rothschild Holding Corporation. There's a whole bunch of them. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. So you're right. All there's I was surprised when I first off, I did not I was incredulous. This is one of my biggest learning jumps forward in 2004 along that first timeline of the story i was telling as i'm going through court i hear this story because i'm starting to look at like what how does the world really work because what i just bumped up into is not on my map so i heard a presentation on google video or maybe i had it on dvd because i do have it on dvd and later it was on google video but i heard this presentation because i had bought some information on like you know research on what's going on so it was a presentation called brotherhood of darkness ominous title by Dr. Uh, Stanley Monteith, who I believe was a dentist who John Gaylor, uh, John Taylor Gatto referred to during the ultimate history lesson because he bootlegged tragedy and hope. So what I heard was him doing a public presentation in, in, in front of the prophecy club, which was like a Christian forum for truth tellers and, and, you know, people who had interesting conspiratorial research and these sort of things. So during this long presentation, 
Monteith is unfolding this story and how there's this, this ominous continuity to it. And I was incredulous because I was like, if any of this was true, I would have heard about it before. You know, I, I considered myself an educated person. I read the Wall Street Journal. I read the New York Times. Like I was, you know, I was a responsible adult at 30 years old. That's what I thought. <laughs> I canceled the and, Wall Street Journal at like 27, I think. I think I read it from like 18 to 27. And finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm done with it. It's so useless. Yeah. It's so useless. Uh, so I'm listening to this presentation and I'm incredulous enough to be like, I don't believe anything this guy's saying. And the book Tragedy and Hope that he was talking about, he tells this whole story and it comes out of this book. So then I, the book is banned. They destroyed the printing plates. You can't get it. So I went and I found a first edition copy of Tragedy and Hope in 2004. Um, and it cost me like $360 or something. It was like $360. Yeah, it, it's, fu it's funny, though, how much money those books cost. You know, like uh, the books that I just talked about, too, like five, six, seven hundred dollars to get a book. So I'm digging into that book and it's really dry history. And there's only a couple pages in there meant to illustrate what's really going on. And the rest of the stuff is just noise to hide that signal. So by the time I got to pages 52 through 54, he's like, here's what's going on. And I was like, wow, I've, I've heard about the Rothschild family on the internet, but I thought it was conspiracy theory. I thought there was nothing there. I thought I'd be stupid to look into it. And what Quigley, Carol Quigley, who was a Georgetown professor of foreign service, who was a mentor to Bill Clinton, who was a Rhodes Scholar, and Clinton, or Quigley was also mentored by a Rhodes Scholar named Crane Brinton. So there's this continuity of power and facilitating that power with an education system. And then I was like, what is this all about? So Quigley made it credible enough for me. Monteith didn't. He made it, he made me incredulous and I had to look him up and fact check him. And then I found out, wow, there's a lot more to that story that's real than I would have ever guessed. So I dig into Tragedy and Hope, the book. It's 1300 pages. And, and Bill pages. Clinton, just for people at home, like Bill Clinton yeah. during his first inauguration said there's two people who like to think and one was JFK and the other one was Carol Quigley. So this is not some nobody, just so people at home who've never heard of this before. This is one of two guys that Bill Clinton mentioned by name in his inauguration. That's, that's correct. That's absolutely correct. And if if Bill Clinton wasn't a Rhodes Scholar, he would not have been governor of Arkansas. He wouldn't have been reigning his his policy and power over the situation at MENA. He wouldn't have inherited that position from Winthrop Rockefeller. Right. There's a whole bunch of things that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't been anglicized. And that's what the Rhodes Scholarship system does. It takes Americans. This is also shown in the recent Guy Ritchie movie, The Gentleman. Mickey is an American Rhodes Scholar a kid with aptitude, but not social position, then you take them and put them in Oxford and then they control that person when they come back to America. There's funnily enough, I'll tell the story, but to jump to the end part, George Stephanopoulos, Bill Clinton, Zeke Emanuel, who's in charge of this whole COVID thing right now. Uh, Rachel Maddow. Uh, and he was whole, also in part of death panel. So I mean, right. he, so Zeke, yeah, Ezekiel these Emanuel, are all, these like are all road scholars yeah, carrying out ago. the, yeah, yeah like 10 years ago, he's saying, you know, people shouldn't live past the age of 75 as he was one of the Obamacare architects, along with Jonathan Gruber, who said it is something along the lines of the only reason we're able to get this passed is the ignorance of the American public and then also lack of transparency. And it's just, you know, it's just so frustrating. But yes, yeah, so sorry to cut you off there. Yeah. So these are all Rhodes Scholars that are at play in America today. Dr. Naomi Klein. No, oh, yeah, Dr. Time, Naomi man. Wolf. No, yeah. Dr. Naomi Wolf that said the yeah. other day that if I would have known that there's going to be more lockdowns, I wouldn't have voted for Biden. I'm like, you're a Rhodes Scholar. You're on the other side of this narrative. You're with the people who still support the opium monopoly and want monarchical power in the world because it facilitates all of that. Right. P Very P cozy Buttigieg. relationship. Yeah. Right. So when you got. Yeah. Yeah. So when you got these Rhodes Scholars that are in play today. It's just good to see what what is a Rhodes Scholar? Where do these people come from? What's the philosophy behind all this? And that's what Tragedy and Hope the book unveils. And on like page uh, 935 or 960, Quigley all of a sudden goes into Council on Foreign Relations and how it came from Cecil Rhodes's last will and testament. And then, the you know, how power flows in America from the top down. Now, the interesting thing about this book is this Tragedy and Hope was published in 1966 after Kennedy's assassinated. There's a much smaller version of this story, and it's called The Anglo-American Establishment. That's the first book Quigley wrote in 1948. It was not published until after he died because he knew he, his, his stated feelings in a New York Times interview with Rudy Maxa in like 1976. He said, I can't talk about this because they'll destroy our career or worse. And he has them stop the tape in the interview and it ends. So 
Anglo-American establishment gives you the concise, here's the people, here's the names, the places, here's the agreements, this is how everything's working. He was scared to have that published during his lifetime, so it's not published till 1981, okay? So the 1981 book was actually written, or the 1981 book was actually written in 1948. And then from 20 years or 18 years from 1948, Quigley had access to the Council on Foreign Relations documents, and he wrote Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics. He was also an excellent history professor. He, he wrote a book called The Evolution of Civilizations, which shows this pattern of civilizations rise and fall through time. And then you could find where we are now. That's very interesting. Um, but getting back to like the overall theme. So that 1966 textbook that I then paid $369 for and got it. And so, so that made it real for me. It's in a book from the 60s by a college professor who's very well esteemed. I should go look for more. And then I found there must be 40 or 50 autobiographies and biographies of the Rothschilds through the, through the last 200 years. There's uh, Count Egon Corti. Count Corti is one of the uh, guys who made uh, a book about them back in like the you know, early 1900s. So there's a, there's a broad spectrum of available information that they have authorized about themselves. So it's no longer for me a conspiracy theory. Now I can read the history. You know, I can I can read Dr. Neil Ferguson's two volume set and be left with that's a great story. But where's all the artifacts and evidence you use to make that story? And then from that incredulity, I went into the, the English and the French archives that are available online still today. And you can search the private papers and the letters and the artifacts and the books. And it's kind of overwhelming because it's just so there right in front of anyone who wants to look. And yet you don't hear about it anywhere, which so I always thought the was Imperial Colleges, Neil Ferguson, who had no, it's a different one. A this different, is oh, Dr. Neil wow. Ferguson, okay. uh, and it's it's spelled N I A L L Ferguson, and he's from Harvard, um, but I believe he's Scottish. Uh, and when COVID came around, and there's this other one from the Imperial College, it got com confusing for me. So thank you for clearing that up because I don't want to confuse anybody. It's quite okay. the well, I, I didn't I, I didn't I didn't know that there was two two uh, big global scumbags with the same name. So okay, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> they so, must be related. Sorry. And looking into going back to the timeline of, of history outside of my story, you're in the post-Civil War period. Well, during the Civil War, Lincoln printed his own money because he got cut off from the international bankers who took control as soon as he was done. They're back in the country. Now, at this time, very interestingly enough, this is this might be the whole the best part that you guys haven't heard yet, right? The interesting part is during that Civil War period, the Rothschilds were in flux in this country they had intended to have solomon de rothschild who wrote those letters they had intended to have him set up shop in america and be the rothschild family representative for a central bank that they're going to create in america okay solomon de rothschild died at age 30 he's like 29 when he wrote those letters so from then on the rothschilds are using a proxy for their representative in america that's not in their family but he is family trained OK, that gentleman's name is August Belmont and August Belmont became the chairman of the Democratic Party. OK, so the political party that was the party of slavery, the chairman of that party is the Rothschild frontman August Belmont. Now, Belmont also had a son who was also extremely capable for the Eastern Year or for the European banking families. And he generally is called the same August Belmont, not junior. So it gets confusing when you try to separate the two. You have to look at the dates and who's saying what and these sort of things. It's kind of like JP Morgan and JP Morgan Jr. Like, and then the company, they all get mixed together when people talk about them. So I like to differentiate like the August Belmont, who was the dad or the August Belmont, who's doing the Rothschild subway brokering in 1908 or whatever that year was. That's the son, right? That's like 40 years after the dad was in charge. So 1859, right before the Civil War, and you can fact check this date because I might have it wrong, but the Republican Party was created in New Hampshire as an abolitionist party. So there was a party that supported slavery, and then they felt the need to create a party that was an abolitionist party, the Republican Party. Today, people think the Republican Party is racist and that the Democratic Party is the, for the people of color. What well, is? Because 
the real racists run that party. The real people who believe in institutional slavery, they run that party. And they've run beautiful propaganda and psychological warfare campaigns from their perspective on the public and gotten the people who they subjugate to love their oppressor, to, to vote for their oppressor, to take the fast track to the new world order, right? So it's just, when you look at the history, you see why things are so bent and corrupt today because nobody understands these dynamics and they think that up is down and they've all been gaslighted, but they don't know the history of what that means. And also so coincidentally enough, about the, it. Uh, the Republican party kind of stole a lot of their platform from a, a free soil party. And the free soil party actually started in my little tiny hometown of Camillus, New York, just by coincidence. But yeah, it is amazing how now you have all the people who are clamoring racism, racism all day. I mean, if you were really racist, I mean, if you wanted to kill black people, you would go fund Planned Parenthood, which has done a better job of killing black people than just about anybody. I mean, even more so than. And it's in their the paperwork that that was one of their goals. Like they want to exterminate and sterilize and do these sorts of things to other people. It's, that's a total violation of the philosophy of freedom, but these people conveniently don't have a philosophy of freedom. So they can very much act like sociopaths or psychopaths on a regular basis and gain power while nice people sit back and hope things are going to change without them taking action. So uh, throughout the later 1800s, Rothschilds, took a much more strong stance in American railroad funding, like all, all the robber barons in our country, they had Rothschild uh, financing, right? So they had Warburg financing, which is under Rothschild because the Warburgs used to live with the Rothschilds. They got mentored by the Rothschilds. Read their family histories. Another, there's a Warburg book by Ron Chernow as well. Get and the, the audio book version. I mean, Paul Warburg yeah. is basically Daddy Warbucks in the play, you know, in the yeah. play Annie. And he was, and, and uh, also, I mean, and then the other Paul Warburg said, You'll have world government whether you like it or not at that UN speech, which is also a real artifact. And he was like did. the guy that created the Federal Reserve, was Paul Warburg. And we recently went down to yeah. Jekyll Island, and uh, I actually have a I actually have footage that I'm going to release soon where I was at the actual room where the Federal Reserve was signed and have and see pictures of Paul Warburg there and, and you know, some and the other five gentlemen who well, I don't want to call them gentlemen, other five people who were there. But it, you know, in terms of your research, have you come across, you know, obviously the quote by Lincoln is something like there's an army in front of me. That's the, the South. And there's an army of European bankers at my rear. And I far more fear their army at my rear. Is that something that you've uh, seen in your research? Is that actually a, tr a true quote or not? As we're talking about Lincoln and and all the uh, the funding of these wars. Yeah, I'm not sure about that quote. And I did find a lot a lot of interesting stuff when I went through, because there's not a lot of Rothschild, uh, like their history during the time of Lincoln is, it's kind of obscure. And they're, they're supporting Judah Benjamin and the Confederacy. There's all these other things going on. But as far as Lincoln goes and, and going up through the assassination and looking at the powers that existed, there was a lot of interesting pieces and artifacts that I had never heard about that... Uh, Anyway, so uh, I wanted to make sure I continued answering your your overall question. Did I answer your micro question right there? Yes. Yep. Sorry about that. All right. So by the time you get to the late 1800s, you have a number of things happening. You have America bringing the Prussian education system that grew up from the first part of this story. The these guys from Harvard, uh, Robert Owen was one of the presidents of Harvard. He goes over to Germany. He's like, wow, these people are so well behaved. We should indoctrinate some people in America like this. And then it starts to eke out education, self-education, especially, and starts to bring in an indoctrination system that will create interchangeable cogs for factories and for these people to uh, continue to groom the future as they please. By the 1890s, you've got the Rothschilds cutting deals with the Rockefeller family because uh, prior to that deal in the 1890s, the Rothschilds had partnered up with the Nobel brothers who were like the Rothschilds of Eastern Europe. So the Nobel brothers, they don't just have a prize. They created dynamite. They created the oil tanker. They created the, the tanker car for oil on train tracks. They uh, helped to build all these oil fields in the Caspian. And then in like 1896-ish, they start dealing with uh, their counterparts on the other side. So the Rothschilds went from banking into oil and the Rockefellers went from oil into banking. And right at the turn of the century, these streams are all merging. Then the Rothschilds are having uh, major in industrial projects in America, like the New York subway system and a whole bunch of other things they're interested, uh, they're involved in financing. And around that same time, Andrew Carnegie wrote Triumphant Democracy. That's a globalist collectivist book. And his picture for America, his 
his adopted homeland because he was Scottish, like he had a different picture for the future. And he was a very rich man. So he was able to seed the future with his ideas. Okay. So now we're getting up to 1902. 1902 is when everything changes. At least if you speak English, everything changed because Cecil Rhodes died. And when Cecil Rhodes died, he left a will. So before I can tell you about that will, who was Cecil Rhodes? Who was this character? Uh, you know, he's an apartheid guy. They pulled down a statue. It's a woke thing. No, 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 no. Cecil Rhodes was an Englishman, a British citizen who went to South Africa to join his brother in uh, gold mining. So his brother is down there. He's already got a gold mine set up. Cecil gets there. His brother's like, hey, I'm going after, uh, you know, gold in a new place. Hang out, have this. Or maybe it was a diamond mine, but it was a mining operation in South Africa. So Cecil, uh, he buys out the farmer De Beers by basically buying all the pumps, letting everyone's mines get flooded, and then buying it all up pennies on a dollar, right? And he's using Rothschild money. Those are his financiers to do this. Oh, so he time, builds man. he builds a, a diamond and gold monopoly in South Africa based on subjugating the natives as slaves. He created the first uh, apartheid, uh, I'm sorry, the, the first concentration camps are created during the Boer War. So like Rhodes and his guys were creating war on their own and then telling the British Empire to like on the uh, afterwards, they're creating war first and getting back up on, you know, so they're like creating their own country. There is a country or there was called Rhodesia named after Cecil Rhodes. Now it's uh, Tanzania, I think. And South Africa was also settled, colonized by the efforts of Cecil Rhodes. So when Rhodes died, what happens? Well, Rhodes was a Freemason and he and his brother Freemason Rudyard Kipling had a globalist collective. No, it's actually, sorry to interrupt. It's actually Zimbabwe, which is even Zimbabwe. More thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Zimbabwe. <laughs> I remember someone correcting me on, on that in the past, and I'm still wrong about it. That's but it's hilarious. Is it that it's Zimbabwe yeah. when we yeah. you know, Zimbabwe with all the monetary problems. Inflation, now, inflation, everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's formerly Rhodesia. Um, so what they had going on was this Freemasonic goal of world domination. And and Kipling, it's it's evident throughout his work. First off, he's training spies. So a lot of these children's book writers, Kipling, Ian Fleming who wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Roald Dahl, oh, sorry, Fleming wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Roald Dahl wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. These are all MI6 spies. They're all James Bond guys, okay? So I'm going to assume, for sake of assumption, it's the only one I'm going to make during this hour and a half. I'll assume that Rudyard Kipling was also acting as somewhat of an informal British intelligence agent because he's training spies through his books. Kim, and Kim Philby, like the book Kim was used by St. John Philby to train his son, Kim, to be a double agent for the USSR in Britain, right? So like that's there. So uh, in 1898, Kipling says, hey, I got a poem for you, America. It's called uh, The White Man's Burden. And it says you should have an internationalist policy. And this is why you should get into the Spanish-American War. And America bought off on it. And they got in to internationalism. Right. Right before Rhodes leaves his will and testament. So by the time Rhodes dies and at one point an executor to his will was Lord Rothschild, though it changed because there was many versions of the will. The, the stated goals in Cecil Rhodes's last will and testament, which is a book printed in 1902 by William T. Steed or Stead, S-T-E-A-D. And in that book, which is available online, you can see a digitized version. And I own William T. Steed's personal copy of the last will and testament of Cecil Rhodes. So I have the artifact made by the guy who wrote the book. That's as good as it gets. And in that book, Cecil Rhodes says, Oh, what a shame that we lost America. And if the British empire had America back, we could take over the world. So he says, I leave my money to create a scholarship called the Rhodes scholarship for this purpose of bringing America back into the empire. And I create, I leave my money to create a secret society. He says it. He uses the word a society, a secret one. That's how he says it. OK, that's a secret society for the purpose of bringing America back into the British Empire. So starting in 1902, all the people who were still holding allegiances to Britain, the Eastern establishment elite, the people who built those big houses up in Newport, Rhode Island, those opium houses from the people who did shipping. Right. Those big pocketed slave endorsing, drug trading families were still 
allegiant to the ongoing opium trade didn't stop just because America started up. That was going on. The reason that the American flag looks just like the British flag in its first version is so American freelance traders could sail into Hong Kong with a flag that looks just like the people who trade opium here and they could trade their furs for opium. That's John Jacob Astor. Read the manifest of his ships. Oh, he got four tons of opium on the ship in trade for those furs he got in America. So when you look at American wealth, the Vanderbilts, all these families did not build it from hard work and sweat and ingenuity. They used other people's slave pain to get those riches. Okay. You mentioned Vanderbilt and Astor, and then you've got Anderson Cooper, who's related yeah. to both of them. So there yeah. you go. That's what I'm talking about. Those are the people who are willing to lie to you every day on TV because they got big family money behind it. So 1902, America starts the, uh, the Pilgrim Society. So the Pilgrim Society is, an, is a transatlantic group of elites who dress up in white, white tie and tails and top hats. And they have their meetings. Now, it's a transatlantic group. So they are eventually planning to rule the world through America and Britain and to have like a Congress in, in Britain and a Congress in America every four years and to kind of switch it back and forth, right? But the British still weren't, they weren't back in bed with America yet because America was still like, whoa, 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 you guys are our enemies. You might speak the same language, but you've got a king or a queen and we got freedom over here, okay? Well, by the time World War I gets stirred up by the Cecil Rhodes Roundtable group that are all in there. So if you want evidence, Watch James Corbett's World War I Conspiracy three-part series. He unfolds all the evidence. There are people that are powerful enough to create wars for their advantage at the cost of your uncles and grandparents and all these other people who, who suffered and died during those. So we should learn the history so that our loved ones and family members who died are not lost in vain to history. We should learn those lessons. So World War I is atrocious, but right before that, they set up the Federal Reserve here in this country, and the same people who set up the Federal Reserve, for the most part, they create a company in 1917 called the American International Corporation, AIC, and AIC is the robber barons who developed America. Now they're going to develop Russia and China because they got plans for Russia and China later, okay? So they want to, they're done here. They're done in Europe. They're done in North America. They go to Russia and China, start building infrastructure for the future, because you can't have all these big wars and all these things and you know mass genocides in the 20th century unless they build infrastructure for all that stuff to be facilitated. So 1917, they start working on that. Also around then, 1916, 1917, there was what was called the Hotel Majestic Conference. And it's this conference of world elite rulers who get together and say, why don't we just start taking over the world? We're doing it already through this world war. How are we going to continue it after the war? So after the war, they create something called uh, well, during the war, 1919, uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs is the British counterpart. And then it's sibling, sub-sibling is the Council on Foreign Relations in America. So the Royal Institute of International Affairs is like a trickle down from the will of Cecil Rhodes. It's not there before because there's no mandate. There's no plan. There's no funding. There's no agenda. But by the time World War II is done and, and the people who succeeded Rhodes, because he left what was called Rhodes's kindergarten, these young, powerful, on the upward uh, people in society who through the next 30 or 40 years were instrumental in World War I, in Paris 1919, in World War II, in the creation of the League of Nations, in the creation of the World Bank, in the creation of the United Nations, all the way up until like the 60s. You can, you can follow their work. I have these four volumes here. That's the round table's own publications from pre-World War I. So you can see what they're telling each other as they're drumming up to war. The other books up there beside it are the, the personal papers of Colonel House from Charles Seymour at Yale in 1924. So you can see how they're like, hey, if the Lucid, if, if we should have a ship go down, what are we gonna do? Oh, you know, and then like 60 minutes later, that thing happens after the dude meets with the king. There's all these interesting aspects that they're not going to teach you in school. They're not going to show it to you on the fucking history channel. And so if you don't learn about these things and go out and find them for yourself and actually internalize that and then figure out how to express it to others so they can find it too. Like we're all left to play Nintendo and watch Netflix. And that's not a, that's not a future. And there will be no freedom in a future where we do not learn how to increase our intellectual aptitude 
and strategically communicate with other people to get things done and get from A to B and meet our goals and move forward because it's and a you, big you story. Lusitania, and then you've got yeah. you know guys like uh, you know J.P. Morgan, where you know essentially the Germans were able to advertise in all of the papers or most of the papers saying, you know, hey, we're going to bomb that ship. We know it's not a, just a civilian ship, and don't don't go on that ship. And then we act like it's a huge war crime to then bomb that ship when there was munitions all over it and everybody knew it. And that part is accurate, but the, the, the part about JP Morgan. So the, the father died in 1912. So that's the son, the, the, the second or junior, right. Who's interacting at that time. But it's interesting yeah. because, because the Titanic sank in 1912 and JP Morgan was booked to be on the Titanic and he was on there until it got to the first stop. And then he got off. So his being on the Titanic led a whole bunch of other rich and powerful people like John Jacob Astor, the fourth. I think was the one who perished or maybe it was the third because the son, the fourth went to school with Bucky Fuller. So John Jacob Astor, the third heir to the opium empire, having the hotel in New York, Waldorf Astoria, that cat's on the Titanic. Now, my question was, what was John Jacob Astor's opinion on the Aldrich bill? Because I would think, I would think if he was negative, maybe it's convenient that you know, people who would stand up a few months later against the Federal Reserve died on that ship, that it was like a, a lure. It was like a lure for certain people who didn't know. And J.P. Morgan also insured those ships. So he have owned the Star Line. Have you ever gotten into, I know Jira Griffin recently has, you know, come out and talk about the Olympic and how the, essentially the Titanic was really this other ship called the Olympic. And then they sort of like swapped it out. And so there's three. Yeah, I'm familiar with that story. So there's the Olympic, the Britannic and the Titanic. And the difference is how many numbers are on the front of the ship. And I've seen I was very convinced by that argument until I did a little more research. And I was like, ah, it sounds good. It sounds catchy, but it might not be the thing. However, I have an artifact here within reaching distance. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a very inconvenient artifact. So I don't know what to make of this. This is a real deal. All right. So this is a book. This is not first edition, first off. This is a book printed in 1898 called Wreck of the Titan Titan, or Futility. So that's the title of the book, Wreck of the Titan. Not Wreck of the Titanic, Wreck of the Titan. I'm just going to read you a paragraph or two. 1898 by Morgan Robertson. Because I was so incredulous. I was like, no way. This book was not written back then. She was the largest craft afloat and the greatest of works of men. In her construction and maintenance, there were involved every science, profession, and trade known to civilization. On her bridge were officers who, besides being the pick of the Royal Navy, had passed rigid examinations on all studies and had pertained to the winds, tides, currents. The same professional standard applied to personnel in the engine room. So it goes through and starts building out a Titanic-like ship, right, that then hits an iceberg and sinks 14 years before the event. Right. So my thinking was either somebody involved with the ownership of the line or something that had something to do with it. Maybe they had read, read that book. Maybe they wrote, you know, because the way the guy who wrote the book, the way it's legit is he was uh, experienced in designing ships so he could see what the future of making ships would be. And then an iceberg is an obvious obstacle. So that part I was able to. okay, that explains that part. But how did these people not pick up on it? And why did anyone not really see the resonance between what could be one of the world's biggest insurance frauds? Because that's what's in that argument where they switched the ships. Yeah, the ships, yeah. Because exactly. they lost insurance on the one and they needed the to get the money for the, the other. Titanic. Yeah. So that's, um, I don't know what the name of that documentary was, but it was interesting. And I try to take yeah, in was, all uh, the evidence and let it marinate and see what sticks and what's val- verifiable. Yeah, it was the lady. She actually approached uh, Judah Griffin uh, back in the day, and uh, like Ed actually helped her get some funding for the for the movie itself, like for the actual documentary itself. And he just had her speak, uh, you know, as a, a speaker at the Red Pill Expo as well. Um, the, you know, it's a very fascinating story, that's for sure. And uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence in there that you know you go and look uh, certain things up, and it's like, hmm, this is you know uh and, and then it comes you know to insurance claims that was made during 9 11 you know all, all these you know uh things that they're yeah it's out like a titanic event history. isn't it yeah it's very yeah. interesting that the yeah. guy got insurance and they got two sets of insurance and and classified it like if the, if both buildings get attacked even by the same people they're two separate incidents like that's a very advanced thought 
And I'm sure the people in the meeting are like, sure, that's never going to happen. And then it happens and no one. And he also sued and won over the airline companies. <laughs> Silverstein. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so very... James Corbett did a great uh, yeah. expose of this 9-11 on the insurance fraud. Yeah. So I highly recommend everyone check out James Corbett. Well, pretty much everything he does. But, you know, I really, yeah. really, uh, you know, recommend they, they check out the one on, on 9-11 this year, specifically on the the insurance fraud. Yeah, you know, I, I'm Norwegian. That's where I grew up 25 years. Uh, Norway is an extremely socialist country. Uh, what I found interesting, you know, I was a part of a group called Junior Chamber International. And, you know, th they're very good at, you know, teaching kids to become extremely eloquent speakers and, mm -hmm. and get out there and actually be become socialized. And, and they also bring you towards, you know, the political system. And uh, uh, it wasn't until I actually saw the uh, the actual uh, main, you know, international event that they host every year, which basically it is, you know, the U United Nations um, Foundation to bring in youth into the organization and mold them, you know, throughout history. And, and guys like, uh, who was it uh, that got shot there in the United States, the president? Um, oh, my goodness. Where am I at there? Which one? Jimmy Carter? Yeah, which one? Jimmy no, uh, because Ford, of uh, Reagan, no. Reagan, <laughs> Kennedy, oh Lincoln, Kennedy, 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 John Kennedy was a member there. Sorry, uh, uh, but what's also interesting is uh, let me. No, it was it was John Kennedy. Yeah. And uh, what what is interesting though? Uh, let me show uh, share something with you because I don't know if you guys remember what happened over in Norway with the mass shooting uh, and everything over in Norway. Uh, at the time, you know, Anders yeah, Baron Bravey, sure. the guy, yeah, he claimed that he was actually part of uh, uh, the Rosicrucians, uh, actually. No, the, um, what are they called now? The, um, uh, they were Knights, uh, Knights of Templar. That's what he claimed that he was a part of. Uh, but what's interesting, at that time, Jen Stoltenberg, which is a familiar name today, he's the head of NATO, he was the prime minister at the time. But let me read a little bit about his early career uh, of this guy. And, and, you know, he's from uh, 1971 to 1981. Stoltenberg was a journalist from the Arbeiderparty, which is the workers' uh, workers' paper in Norway. Uh, from 1985 to 89, he was the leader of the Workers' Youth League. Uh, from 1989 to 1990, he worked for the executive officer of the statistics in Norway Central and then Norway Central Institution for Producing Statistics. Yeah. He also worked uh, part time, hourly paid uh, as an instructor at the University of Oslo. Uh, and between uh, 1990 uh, to 1992, he was a leader for the Oslo chapter of the Labour Party. Up to 1990, he was a regular. He was in regular contacts with a Soviet diplomat. He ended that relationship after being in informed by the Norwegian uh, police, uh, security police, the PST, that his contact was a KGB agent. Uh, and, uh, you know, he uh, stopped ending that at that, but uh, he was actually named in a lot of papers uh, back at the time. And his name was uh, Stelko, Steklo, uh, they called uh, Stoltenberg. Of course, Stoltenberg has been a part of a lot of organizations, including Gavi, he is all over the United Nations, uh, being a top advisor there and, and working on the uh, Global Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, he's now, of course, the head of NATO. Uh, but the, the head of NATO part, uh, you know, become after he actually, we had that shooting. And the, the shooting in Norway is interesting as well, because, you know, as the, we saw with 9-11, the Boston bombings, there was, uh, you know, uh, training exercises right before that had the exact same scenario that happened half and they, they actually ended the exercise half an hour before you know they got the uh they got the news that you know the parliament building was blown up in norway uh which actually you know what's even interesting is my my dad he was trying to sell uh, our uh, the kind of old farm that we used to have and this guy had called my dad to buy the farm uh from him you know to get fertilizer for the massive bomb that you know uh, the, uh, literally killed i think like six seven people downtown in oslo and it like a lot of my friends actually had injuries from that time as well so uh but it's interesting but let's go back to his dad though uh Thorwald Stormberg, which is uh passed away in 2018 well he was a member of the trilateral commission <laughs> so you know these guys uh and um so he's like no, a the, Trudeau, you know, oh, Justin Trudeau is oh, Pierre 100%, Trudeau's. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so it's like the next generation of yeah. um, 
globalist influence on you. So the other example would be um, David de Rothschild, the Jesus of the Green Movement. Yeah. He's a scion of a multi-billion dollar banking family that's had influence for years. And then he's the leader of that movement. Now they they stepped him back because it was kind of just too obvious. He's telling us about global warming. He's writing his handbook. All the rock stars are doing whatever he says. I'm like, I don't know. Something doesn't seem right. Um, and as far as like the NATO and the, those connections that you're looking at through, uh, through those last couple of Wikipedia pages, that's also a plan that's been continuing since world war two, since yeah. they, you know, and so it goes back to all this thing, whether it's KBG and, and the Soviets or the Venona transcripts, and you can see all these places that, yeah, there was legitimate infiltration. I was, I, was oh, yeah. fly, I was flying through uh, Chicago during one of the NATO summits that was going on, and I, ha- I had one of my Iron Man triathlon backpacks on, and I was it's funny I was like in the urinal, and I see another guy with the Iron Man backpack on, and it turns out he's like uh, one I don't want to say what place, but one of the Eastern European uh, NATO member and so i started talking with him and, and since i were both iron men like he sort of let his guard down i started getting into all this crazy stuff about what's going on in libya and syria and man, mainly libya at the time he's like yeah i don't really know how you know all that stuff but he was like basically confiding in me that all that stuff was true just because you know as a fellow iron man and i was you know probably like 26 or something at the time so he was you know willing to you know kind of admit some of this stuff to me but it was just crazy but you know before we run out of time i'd also like to see if you can get into the bank of international settlements we've talked a lot about the federal reserve we talked a lot about, you know, who really runs the world. But when it gets to, you know, the a lot of people, a lot of listeners, you know, they, they know about the Federal Reserve. And they're starting to wake up to that. But what they don't realize is that there's even, uh, and for those who don't know, there's a book called Tower of Basel. And it really kind of details, uh, you know, a lot about the, even though it's written by an establishment guy, it really does detail a lot about the Bank of International Settlements. But Richard, can you get into a little bit about who the BIS is, uh, maybe a little bit about their founding and why they're so important uh, for people to understand their role, especially as we're talking about having this, you know, central bank digital currencies and, you know, the BIS is talking about it, the Fed's talking about it, Jerome Powell's talking about it, you know, the Bank of, uh, the bank of Japan's talking about it, the European Central Bank is basically saying we're, are, we're going to be going on this very soon, and the Bank of England's talking about it. And so, as this is very important now because we're starting to get to that point where we're going to be moved on to this currency that the people at that point are not really going to be able to fight back. And then they're obviously going to tie that into universal basic income and then tying that into, hey, you didn't get your vaccine. So now your money's cut off. And this is really just a it should be a moment where everybody is screaming at the top of their lungs. At, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm being you know, too dramatic over this. But once we get to this point, it's going to be really a no return point, you know, except for those of us that bought, you know, Bitcoin or Monero or gold. And even then it's not gonna be a fun world. We're not gonna be able to travel, but you know, maybe correct me if you think I'm, you know, over exaggerating some of this stuff, but you know, it's a, a scary place where we're going. And, and just, if you can let us know that the BIS's role in, in this, in the global, uh, you know, monetary financial unit. All right. So the BIS is like the Rosetta stone to the story I've been telling for the last hour and a half. This, uh, when Carol Quigley had tragedy and hope, uh, published in 1966 and it gets to they they destroy the plates so they can't be reprinted in 1968 the book is gone from the market it's gone and when it reemerges, there was a censored version and the pages they took out had the text that i'm about to uh to share with you in uh in a different story form so i'm going to give you the history of the bis this is the page that uh in page 52 or 56 that was missing when i went through and it tells you the, the banking infrastructure. So I'm going to put this on screen so we can both read it together. And I'm going to bring this up a little bit so you can see more of the quote. The Bank for International Settlements was formed in 1930. The main actors in its establishment were then governor of the Bank of England, Montague Norman, and his German counterpart, <clears throat> parenthetically, born in Brooklyn, uh, Helmar Schacht, later Hitler's finance minister. Okay, so the people who made the Bank for International Settlements, it's the British and the people who funded the Nazis. Okay, the bank was originally intended to facilitate reparation payments imposed on Germany by the Treaty of Versailles in after the First World War. Parenthetically, that was 1919. The need for the bank was suggested in 1929 by the Young Committee and was agreed on in August of that year at a conference at The Hague, which is in the Netherlands. A charter bank. Sorry. Uh, Charter for the bank was drafted at the International Bankers Conference at Baden-Baden in November. The charter was adopted at a second Hague conference 
on July on January 20th, 1930. During the period of 1933 to 1945, <clears throat> World War II, the board of directors of the BIS included Walter Funk, a prominent Nazi official, and Emil Poole, who were both convicted at the Nuremberg trials after World War II, as well as Hermann Schmitz, the director of IG Farben, and Baron von Schroeder, the owner of the J.H. Stein Bank, the bank that held the deposits of the Gestapo. There were allegations that BIS had helped the German loot, uh, Germans loot assets from occupied countries during World War II. As a result of these allegations, at the Bretton Woods Conference in July 1944, parenthetically, not the one where they took us off the gold standard in 1972. This is the first one. Uh, Norway proposed the liquidation of the bank for international settlements at the earliest possible moment. This resulted in the BIS being subject of a disagreement between the American and British delegations. The British had different agenda and different goals than the Americans, apparently. The liquidation of the bank was supported by other European delegates, as well as the United States, including Harry Dexter White, who I believe was a communist spy and possibly a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, Secretary of the Treasury and Henry Morgenthau, who trained Giuliani and all these characters you see today. That's Morgenthau Sr. and Jr.'s legacy is uh, Elliot Spitzer and Rudy Giuliani and these other characters you see on TV, but opposed by John Maynard Keynes, head of the British delegation. The disagreement led to Chase Bank, disrepresentative Dean Acheson, uh, interrupting Keynes. So all the people involved <clears throat> are kind of like dirty birds. They're doing things that they know are taking away people's freedom and liberty. They're backed by the Nazis, the Bank for International Settlements. And that's why when they were like still circulating tragedy and hope out there on the internet, it was a censored form. And when they did reprint the second half of the book, they censored the first half of the book, which makes any, any history of like understanding the second half, like a moot point. It doesn't make any sense without the first half of the book. So all these aspects were put out in the public to undermine and confuse people from actually understanding, oh, there's a group of people. They funded the Nazis. The Nazis conducted experiments. They brought those experiments back home after the, after the war. They created the United Nations. They implemented a technocracy. They started facilitating all the computer and surveillance that they needed. And then they wrote AI algorithms to control the behavior and influence people. And it's, it's all right there. And it's not about freedom. All the history goes back to the people who funded the Nazis, which are the same people who popularized eugenics, which are the same people who are behind this worldwide vaccination campaign right now yeah. and paying off Gavi in these other places. Yeah. Hey, uh, here's uh, here's one thing that uh, I want to show you that I, uh, I worked on during an anarcho-pocal speech. Uh, and I don't know if you guys can see this here. This is, uh, of course, like how... Uh, they plan like the plan to set up the new control grid of financials uh, with the financial stability board at the helm of it, controlling all the central banks in the world, including the Federal Reserve. Uh, and as you can see here, the, I have biz over here, you know, the number two that actually, you know, uh, with the International Monetary Fund, you know, works with the G20 uh, group. And then, of course, the biz. Uh, did seed funding to create the Financial Stability Board. And let me actually show you here, uh, if we go right over, let me just pull this down here. We got the, uh, yeah, here we go, Financial Stability Forum. So as you can see here, the first head of the Financial Stability Board was Andrew Crockett back. And, and uh, But this was, it was called the Financial Stability Forum at the time, not the Financial Stability Board. And as you can see, he was a general manager at the time, also a Bank of International Settlements. So they actually created this. And then you could see that it was still called the Financial Stability Board for a while. Then the last Financial Stability Board head was Mario Draghi that uh, in the 2008 crisis, well, they created the Financial Stability Board. You could see the transition here. Uh, and then, of course, we had Mark Carney, uh, that, you know, the, the Carney man, I call him, from uh, Bank of uh, Canada. He destroyed Canada, and then he moved to England, destroyed England, and then he went to the Financial Stability Board. And now he's back in Canada, pushing green bonds and total UN control, by the way, together with uh, uh, Trudeau. And, well, who's the current head of the Financial Stability Board for the world? No others than uh, Randall K. Quarles. <laughs> Uh, and as you can see, the, these guys are all over it. But what they created with the uh, Financial Stability Board is they created a subsection of controls. They called it standard setting bodies. 
And uh, they have them. As, as you can see, one of the standard setting bodies is the Bank of International Settlements because they supervise every single bank in the world. But they also have all the securities uh, through what is called the IOSCO. Uh, and then they have all the uh, accounting standards in the world set by the International Accounting Standards Body. And they, they go into every country from, from those server organization. And then the International Association of uh, insurance supervisors. So the, you can see the, the, the grid here. And then of course, a lot of the guys that are in the financial stability board also get a lot of, there's a lot of information being put by, out by a group called G30. And let me just quickly go and show you the group of G30 here. Uh, and as you can see, there's, you know, a usual perpetrators here, like uh, this guy, for example, uh, Augustin Carstens that are- These are all worker know, bees though. These are not the yeah. masterminds. No. Uh, but what you can These see is- These are just going the... for their job to pay for their country club membership and uh, get a bigger <laughs> Oh, vote. exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and and as you can see here, these guys are, you know, putting together all the information that is getting now pushed out to the to the central banks in the world, uh, including the Bank of Canada and everywhere. Yeah, I just don't get it. It's like the, the, the bank that was created to help the Nazis do looting is in charge of all the banks right now. Yeah. I thought the Nazis <laughs> lost the war- can someone explain this to me? Because I, I guarantee you, most of the people in that group of 30, they don't know that history. Oh, the bank, it, B, BIS not, yeah. isn't telling them. Yeah. BIS used to share headquarters with world, uh, the world headquarters for Freemasonry and some other ominous group. It was a circular building in Basel. Did you ever see that headquarters? You no, know, I never, no, never seen that, uh, that uh, early headquarters. Now, other than the Tower of Babel that they uh, basically unless I'm built in. Memori like, unless yeah. I'm misremembering. And then, I'm like, Thomas sure. McKittrick then goes on to be, I think, worked for Chase. And then you've got the either number two or number three. I, th I forgot if it was Helmar Schacht or I can't remember the. It, but, but that's he, the best part that Hitler's banker, Helmar Schacht, who sounds like a German guy, he's actually from Brooklyn. He's connected to all these American Wall right. Street financiers. And he's like Johnny on the spot. If you read Anthony Sutton's trilogy, Wall Street and uh, Hitler, the Bolshevik Revolution and Hitler, and then FDR, or it's, uh, what's the other one? What's the three books? I'm um, getting old, man. I've done this too long. <laughs> you guys know who Anthony Sutton is? Yeah, he actually, he worked, uh, I, I know that I met, um, what is his name now? Um, Patrick Woods, uh, you know, talked to uh, yeah. in great yeah, detail about the technocracy rising. Right. Uh, in 1976 and 78, yeah. they wrote a book together. And then Charlotte Iserbeet gave her family skull and bone information oh, yeah. to Anthony Sutton. And but Sutton had like 13 other books he wrote on gold. He wrote a whole bunch about Soviet technology and Western development. And then he wrote uh, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, Wall Street and Hitler, Wall Street and F FDR. Were the okay, three actually, books. I didn't know who he was. I knew I know who Charlotte Iserbeet is, you know, the deliberate dumbing down of America. So this is he gave her stuff. the or she gave him the documents after her dad died. So the best is uh, Griffin at G. Edward Griffin did an interview with Sutton. And I mean, he just like the, the, the fact that he got Norman Dodd, uh, he got Yuri Bezmenov and uh, he's got this other interview with Anthony Sutton. Like those, he's already hit the trifecta 30 or 40 years ago. Ed has like that's those are really well-placed interviews. So if you watch the Anthony Sutton interview and uh, Stan Monteith also does an Anthony Sutton interview, highly educated professor who worked for the Hoover Institute for, you know, revolution and peace. It was like the, you know, he worked for a big think tank. And then when he's writing these books, David Packard, who's his boss is a trilateral commission guy. So Sutton is writing trilaterals, you know, these books and doing these interviews and his boss is like, ah, you're out of here. And then they made him persona non grata. And then Sutton had to figure out how do I publish my own book without research money from this big nonprofit that he worked for. So he is also one of the earlier whistleblowers that I learned about during my path after being a whistleblower. You know, what's uh, one thing like we were talking about technocrats, if you, if you actually go and read this book, I, I think it's probably like at least three, four hundred times the word technocrat is mentioned in the book uh, that I had there. Another thing that I, I, I don't know if you're aware of a lady called Grohal and Brundtland. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and she is, you know, of course, uh, another person that came out of the the Labour Party in Norway. She was a former prime minister in Norway. She's the former head of the World Health Organization. She also wrote the paper you know, that created the sustainable development goals called Our Common Future. She wrote it with a guy from the province that I live in right now uh, called Maurice Strong. Right here. Yeah, I know yeah. Momo, Momo Strong, I call him. Yeah. He's, in my, he's in my model, and, too. Yeah, and what's interesting with Strong is that he actually got funded by Rockefellers as he was working in the oil industry in Alberta. 
but he got promoted by Edmund Leopold de Rothschild, who at that Agenda 21 <laughs> yeah. conference says, here's what we're actually trying to do. And this is yeah. years before they made it a rule for everyone else. Yeah. So I just like to show people, it's like, that's how history trickles down. Yeah. You know, Edmund de Rothschild says something in like 1986, and then 10 years, 15 years later, the world is starting to step to that beat of that drummer that drummed years ago in that meeting. And you see how long it takes power to trickle down and become like uh, visible to the regular public because these people are trickling their answer, their actions down through meetings that occur, occur in Rio and right before that and before that and before that. But Grow Harlem, Brooklyn and uh, Momo Strong, Maurice Strong, Morris Strong, he preferred to be called, I'm sure. Uh, he passed away recently. And uh, there's a was lot club, to all of that. Was he Club of Rome? I don't know if he was. I think he... I, I don't want to stay definitively because I wouldn't know where to recall the source for that fact, but he was definitely informed of the club of Rome's plan. Like they're all stepping to that plan as well. That was late, late sixties. Yeah. And, and one thing and, that, in 1992, they had another plan that they put out. Yeah. And getting back to, uh, I forgot it was a Helmar Schnack or one, one of those top guys at the BIS was signing all of his correspondences, Hail Hitler. And this is during the war. And then meanwhile, you've got, you know, American interests, you know, funding the BIS. Well, also, I think 80% of their, of the funding of the BIS during World War II was coming from the Reich Bank and the Reich, and they were paying their, their fees in gold and they were getting their gold from the teeth of, you know, Jews that they killed. And then now, you know, all these companies like, you know, IG Farben that you mentioned, you know, they get to, you know, basically get spun off into, you know, Bayer, then Bayer then gets to buy Monsanto and then, you know, then all, then Bill Gates now is, you know, one of the, yeah, one the, of the biggest owners of the, Monsanto. He kind of divested out of Microsoft. And then people are like, oh, my grandpa the other day is like, are you saying Bill Gates is a bad guy to me? And then like, but meanwhile, <laughs> I kept like going into like doing like the Richard Grove thing and just going deep into everything. And he's like, are you saying that the Rhodes Scholarship now is bad? I'm like, well, do you have time? I can tell you about the Rhodes Scholarship, <laughs> but they just don't want to hear it. And then like, it's getting into like all these rabbit holes. But yeah, you know, someone in their 80s is not going to, you know, wake up to their entire world, you know, view being, you know, shattered at, at this stage of the game but you know i do want to be cognizant of your time because you know we are coming up now in an hour and a half and but this has been like one of the most fascinating conversations and i do know you know you mentioned Jerry griffin's trifecta and so far you know just in the past month we've had our trifecta of, of yourself and Jerry griffin and then we had jim cantrell of spacex on yesterday so if you guys are not subscribed to our channel or you know, even better yet an email list you know what are you guys waiting for because you know we're this is information that's not going to be on youtube forever i i briefly teased us it was on youtube for a little little bit and then cut it right as we started getting into the super juicy stuff and so they didn't get the beginning they didn't get the end and so we want to incentivize people to get the heck yeah. off of youtube to not be watching us over there although we do love you know our youtube audience but you know we know that's a good way to reach people but you guys should be doing other things one of those other things you should be doing that i forgot to mention in the beginning and feel bad about was richard's autonomy course so i'd like to have him get more into that because you know a couple years ago and i i mean I, a lot of people don't know the story is i ended up uh you know coming up with all these ideas for how people can get you know if you bought a crypto early on and now you made a bunch of money how you can sell it into special types of trust and charitable trust you know the same tools that the big guys are not the, not not joe biden big guy but the same tools the other big guys are using to help you know take your your wealth and diversify it out without getting killed in taxes and for doing so i ended up losing a six-figure job a residual income and getting absolutely hammered you know in in the process and you know beaten down and and here i am now at, the, at this point but while i was doing that at one point you know nearly bankrupt i spent you know a bunch of money on a course through grant cardone and took you know cardone university and i'll tell you that right now like that in and of itself, not to pimp him because I know that you're probably that plus a whole bunch more, uh, was a much better investment than anything I did in college. And so you take, you know, I'm taking you know, marketing classes that are all bullshit and, you know, you don't learn anything or sales classes. Or I took a class in the Federal Reserve where my classmates won the national competition against Harvard, Yale, and MIT, and I didn't even know it was private. So, and I was on the national, the inside track, and I didn't even know that this was private. So, you know, if, so for so for people out there who have you know kids, you know maybe you've got you know a twenty year old son or or daughter, and you're thinking of sending them to school, or they're already in school. A lot of what they're learning is already obsolete. I was I got on Facebook in 2004 when I was a freshman in college, and now you know, and we, there was no marketing on you know social media marketing or anything. And when I was telling people what I was planning on doing, they all basically laughed at me. And so it is so important that people are getting outside of the mainstream, or if your kids are in 
in the the system now, you know, making sure that they're being able to get unschooled, because uh, you know we know things are tough. We know not everyone can you know homeschool their kids, although you know they, you know that you know they should be, and I'm, that's a you know a fight that I'm going to have later on with my ex. But we'll get to that. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. But anyways, can you tell people more or let them know about autonomy, what it is, and because really you know that's the future. And I'm even trying to tell people now. Listen, if your child are young like mine, like I've got a three year old and a five year old. I stopped saving for their college a couple years ago because I'm like, you know, in the future, why don't I just have them go to, hey, who's the best, you know, negotiator? Have them take their class. You know, don't, you know, obviously not going to have them take the Paul Krugman master class, you know, which is such a joke. But, you know, having, you know, the Chris best people. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, having Chris the best. Voss is a master negotiator. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm picking up on where. So <clears throat> there's a big problem in the world. And I would describe it like this. Schooling leaves us with an earning disability. It doesn't teach us what we need to know to survive and thrive in the world, to make an offer and to be able to transact and bring revenue into our household, to keep a roof over our heads, to feed our families and do all these things. So there's a lot of people out there wandering and they're doing trial and error. And you mentioned uh, Grant Cardone. I've been through Cardone's sales class. I've been through Dan Locke's high ticket sales class and graduated that. Uh, I've been through Quantum Growth by Sabri Subi. In fact, the he, uh, Sabri Subi, who created uh, King Kong marketing in Australia. It's a multi, it's a, it's a big marketing agency. And so they put out a course earlier this year and uh, we had invested in that. So that was like a $15,000 price tag on that investment to, and what it takes for an individual is I knew I could put that into, into motion and pay itself off real quick. I have that self-knowledge. I didn't have to believe, is this thing going to work? I knew what I was getting. I know how to do due diligence. I made a strategic investment right when COVID was kicking off. A lot of people want to be scarcity minded and the winners, the people who succeed, they say, this means I need to move faster. I need to take my money and do something bigger with it than just letting it sit there during this uncertainty. Right. So uh, he now, just I've released. Doubled, I've uh, doubled in size since, since coronavirus hit. So yeah. So yeah. So uh, it, as this unfolded, I just made it like a strategic goal to stay focused and not get distracted by this global situation because I can't control it. So he just released that testimonial of mine for his course, which is an advanced toolbox for a larger company to implement multi-million dollar marketing campaigns, right? Something we wanted to be able to have for ourselves, but also apply it to our other business models. I founded the University of Reason, and there's a bunch of courses in there from Michael Badnarik's uh, Constitution course to Benny Wills' Parhesia course to the upcoming Mark Passio course um, and a couple other uh, all-stars from the Liberty community that are doing online courses. My course isn't about teaching you how to make a course, though as being an entrepreneur, that might be a project and you might have some wisdom to get out there and we can't facilitate that. But the reason I created autonomy was this gap, this earning disability, it doesn't go away with the paycheck. You get bills, you're still go wearing the golden handcuffs and the golden handcuffs are really on your brain. And they're going to be on your brain until you outgrow that thinking, that limitation, that artificial scarcity, the provisional self-esteem, all these limiting beliefs that do not serve us, they're holding us back. So the first part of my course, which is a 15 week training for entrepreneurs, for employees, for executives, and I have students that are anywhere from 18 to 83 who are going through and graduating through the course. So first part is unindoctrinate yourself from the limiting beliefs. The second part is let's add a culture of excellence and integrity and showing up on time and doing what you said so you can work and play easily with others. And then we give you high value skills, <clears throat> sales, marketing, consulting. We give you access to all this. We also have a dojo area where people practice the skills with each other. And then outside of the course, when students graduate, they can either get a job, start their own business, or they can have a chance at freelancing at our consulting company that handles businesses. So my course handles individuals and their journey moving forward. And our, our consulting company handles uh, other businesses um, pretty much not just Liberty community, though I do a lot of pro bono work for people who don't have a marketing budget, but we have VIP clients that we service and we provide a technology stack to put their marketing on autopilot, which allows us to do a whole bunch of cool things that otherwise uh, we wouldn't have money to let a bunch of people do things as apprentices and interns and gain the valuable experience. So by doing a pro bono account for like a, a Benny Wills type of situation, we have some interns and apprentices and professional freelancers to get his site and uh, his course and all these things refined for public launch. So there's a variety of capacities, but you're not going to wander into these skills randomly by watching YouTube videos or even Cardone or Dan Lock. Those are all kind of micro skill sets. And what I'm giving you is a macro toolbox, a Swiss army knife for life and a skeleton key for success. 
And where can they find out more information on that? Get autonomy.info forward slash 19 skills. There's a PDF. It's a small booklet we made. Those 19 skills are not what you get in this course. Those 19 skills were on two slides out of 15 weeks of, of lectures. So it's a very small piece of value, but essential to build from. And from that, people can see if they'd like to have more. I lecture Friday nights, 9 p.m. to 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. I do a live question and answer afterwards. I do a, another Q&A on Sundays for my students. And in between during the week, we practice the skills that I'm teaching, which involve intellectual self-defense, critical thinking, compassionate communication strategies, and ethical marketing. And I have heard a lot of people rant and rave about your course. I know I think Michael Nimitz is one of them who's been, you know. Oh, for sure. Yeah, he's an all-star. About raving about your course and, and you know, definitely promoting it big time. And uh, do you want to also promote your Grand Theft uh, World uh, website and a podcast that's going to be launching as well? Sure. GrandTheftWorld.com uh, has a podcast. We do it live Sunday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern. I usually have autonomy students and graduates live in the Zoom meeting when we're doing it. So we have fact checkers. We have people who can bring other resources. Uh, and then we stream it out on Twitch uh, under the Grand Theft World Twitch handle. Awesome. Well, it goes thank on you. for three or four hours. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're just a wealth of knowledge. Love to have you on in the future. And and for everyone that has not heard of Richard Grove before, definitely check out his websites. Definitely check out, you know, just the cornucopia of names he dropped today. Uh, I mean, if this doesn't get us kicked off YouTube, I mean, I don't know what will, but, you know, we're trying. We're trying our, our, our darndest yeah. over here to, to get kicked off. And there is one could, name we could say that could get, get, get kicked oh, yeah, off, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah, that's that's so do not look up the uh, CIA whistleblower that you're not allowed to mention <laughs> that leaked the Christopher Steele dossier, I believe, that Rand Paul mentioned on the mm -hmm. floor. And actually, it's a it's an Italian Italian name. Uh, yeah, they shut down C-SPAN over that and stuff that day. It's like they pulled that video. So, yeah, I won't get you banned. And I, I want to thank I you guys because you're very intelligent. Too, so I, I know it, but I won't. Okay. Um, I want to thank you guys for being so informed and actually diligent and you guys seem to look facts up on your own. And so that's a pleasure for me to, to you know, have a conversation yeah. with you guys because you get what I'm saying and you're helping to translate it to your audience and fielding their questions. And if anyone has any questions about the resources or artifacts I mentioned, send me an email, I'll send you back some links and everybody can learn and grow forward. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't wait to talk more uh, with you and uh, we'll hope to have you on for a lot of more times. If you could just stay on for one or two uh, more minutes after I'm going to show you something else too, if you have uh, yeah, right on. Yeah. All right. It's Take been care, a pleasure. Guys. Thank you. Thank you for watching our recent video. Behind me is the Jekyll Island Club, which is where the Federal Reserve was formed. And so in addition to making content and in addition to making, you know, different YouTube videos and library videos, I'm also a financial advisor with a great track record. Uh, 2019, we had almost got almost all the gains of the S&P 500. And then when everything hit the fan in March of 2020, we had almost none of the losses. What I'd really recommend if you have not seen it uh, is check out my speech where it was given uh, February 11th down in Acapulco, Mexico, uploaded to YouTube February 19th. And at the end of that video, I did a little GoPro commercial, sort of like I'm doing now that was ad-libbed, where I told people what the investment strategy was. I told people that what we had did is we were uh, long the S&P 500 while also buying put options on the S&P 500. And what that meant was that was how we were able to get this because I knew the market was gonna either keep going up because of Federal Reserve money printing or it was gonna collapse because reality would actually set in. So, you know, how many advisors actually protected your clients against that? I mean, I would say hardly any of them. So unless you were in a position where, you know, you made almost all the gains last year and didn't make the, didn't, you know, really participate in that many of the losses this year, then, then you don't have a reason to call me. But, you know, if that's not the case, then I would go check out the website, thelibertyadvisor.com, where you can book a time to talk with myself and to get a free consultation to see if we can help put you on a better path. Again, that's thelibertyadvisor.com. And thank you very much and hope to talk with you and your family soon. Take care.